You are watching the Big Dog Post Game Show, brought to you by Viner Forgates and the Big Dog himself, Rick Jacklich, at the Jacklich Law Group. Good afternoon from the Viner Forgates Studios. I'm Wayne Viner. That's Bruce Posner, and we're here to talk about Maryland's 31 13 win over the Auburn Tigers and, and what that means for the program. Bruce, this is the first time we've been on the air talking about the game together. You usually have an interesting take, so we'll start with what did you see out there in Nashville? Well, I think the main thing I saw was a uh, superior coaching job by Coach Mike Loxley over Hugh Freeze. Mike Loxley was ready for this game. He had the team ready. It looked like Auburn was almost going through the motions. And uh, as a result, you saw the one-sidedness of the of the game. And uh, I thought Lox did a great job. Uh, he just he just proves to me, look, things are never perfect. But you're talking about beating a team that Maryland did 31 to 13 <clears throat> that had Alabama on the ropes, literally took a Hail Mary to beat them. So and they were playing their first string quarterback, by right, Peyton Thorne. And we made their offense. The Terps made their offense look non-existent and that's without Bo Braid and that's without uh some of the guys who didn't play they had well, the Bo, same problem Bo played Tarheeb still did not who's also I'm sorry I meant Tarheeb I meant Tarheeb but my point is that uh everybody was missing pieces we were missing our main piece uh Talia and yet the offense early on was somewhat seamless I thought that uh, Billy Edwards, your favorite guy, I thought he was uh, for not having played in you know in that position all year. I thought he was great. Obviously, his passing to himself left a little be desired. He was short. He missed some. Uh, he just didn't let it fling, if you know what I mean. But no. the way he managed the team, I thought was great. And his running was a la Josh Allen. I give him a solid B. How about you? For the first quarter or so, I gave him an A. After that, he didn't fare so well. You know, he finishes six for 20. He he left some of that game on the field, to be honest. He didn't complete a pass out of his last 10 throws. For Maryland, and doing a postgame show, this was almost looking being on the other side of the looking glass. Whereas if you're Auburn, you can say statistically, this game was pretty close on paper. Uh, they had 300 yards, Maryland had 310. Auburn had the ball 32 minutes. Statistically pretty close, but Auburn had the turnovers. And when the game was in doubt early on, Maryland shut down that offense. So on paper in the end, it came out pretty close. Auburn could never really get close in the game. I give a lot of credit to the Maryland defense. They under Coach Williams, they have done a really great job of mixing players. The rotations in the end of the season end up working. One of the reasons it's important that Brian Williams rotates so many guys is what you saw on that field happens. Jay Sean Barham, who is Maryland's probably leading linebacker, transferred to Michigan, so he's not on the field. Tarheeb's still probably the best corner Maryland has. He's going pro. He's not on the field. Uh, but when you put those freshmen out there and a couple of the other cornerbacks like Gavin Gibson, who played a lot, also transferred out. So you end up with the third, fourth and fifth corners playing a lot like a Perry Fisher. Whitaker, number 17, plays on the defensive backfield. They're all effective. They've all been on the field before. So they don't have the Billy Edwards problem. You're right. Billy had about 14 snaps this season and six or seven of them came on short yardage and he has six touchdowns. So while on the field, he was effective. His points per minute probably lead the all of college football, six touchdowns. And he probably played 10 clock minutes in the whole season. Really effective Maybe. guy as a runner. Go ahead. This, the only way you can look at it, I know you talked about statistics or even, but you know how statistics lie. They were never in the game. I don't care what you say or how you look at it. They were never in the game, per se. 21 nothing. They closed the 21-7. 
And uh, the pick six put the game away in the field goal. The 50-yard field goal by Jack Howells was, uh, you know, something that we didn't expect. But they were never in the game. Auburn looked pedestrian to me as for a team. I don't care if they were 6-6. Six and six, But it, when you look at who they beat, it was not an impressive list. Okay? Well, and you when you talking, look at the fa- – Well, before you go, go through the whole season, the, you mentioned the Alabama game. And – they didn't just haven't to me. They just didn't recover from the Alabama game. Maryland had that problem after they played Ohio State, where they came out the next two games. They played Illinois, didn't look so good. Went to Northwestern, didn't look so good. I think Al, uh, Auburn just didn't recover from that game. Their season was over, and they played like it. And he couldn't motivate them to play any better. Now you can take a look at the rest of the season. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh... But, you know, they played in the game, they accepted the bowl bid, and they played horrible. It's that simple. I mean, I I turned on all the Auburn stations, all the guys like you and me who do it for Auburn, and there's a lot more than just me and you, all right? I mean, they had about 15 guys, and the only thing that they could uh, drag out of the game was the third-string quarterback threw a bomb that was complete for a near touchdown, and they were able to convert. And outside of that, Peyton Thorne was horrible. I mean, he went bad. He was horrible. And the backup was no better. Yeah. Peyton Thorne didn't run. This is a guy who's supposed to be running quarterback. He didn't run much. The Auburn ground game, SEC big-time ground game, had nothing against Maryland. Maryland did a really good job. You notice, I noticed during the game that they sort of went to what looked like a, a flex defense, like the old Dallas Doomsday, where they didn't line up on the line exactly. They had some guys dropping back. It was confusing as who was going to rush. They look really prepared. And if anybody's going to get poached off of this Loxley coaching staff, it's Brian Williams. who's a defensive coordinator. Arkansas made a run at him last year. He stays at Maryland. I hope they can come up with whatever money it takes to keep him. They don't have the, the greatest recruits on that defensive side of the ball, but he found a way to, with changing personnel on a regular basis, to keep these big teams in check throughout the season. If you look back on Auburn, they lost a game 38-10 to to New Mexico State, who had a great season. Maryland this year doesn't have any of those blowout wins. There wasn't a case where somebody fully outclassed the Maryland Terrapins, and that's a huge step towards winning the big games. I've said it before, I said in the postgame after the bowl, that you generally don't go from losing these games against your Ohio States and Michigans by 50 points. You go from losing by 50 to being really close and then see if you can take the next step. Over the past two seasons, I think you'd agree that Mike Loxley and the Maryland Terrapins are getting closer. They might not have caught him yet, but you can see that they're a play or two away. And a lot of the SPN folks made a pretty big deal out of Maryland having the ball by 99 yards away against Michigan with a chance to tie them up do you see or win or win or win do you see the growth in this team without question i mean after you watch this game against Auburn, you look at next year's schedule which i've already done i'm sure you have too and you see uh, oregon and usc all right as your two like different games other than uh penn state and ohio state correct and uh, maryland Plays Penn State. They do not play Michigan or Ohio State. You open with UConn. Right. Uh, you got Penn Michigan State. State the second week. You got Virginia the third week, and then it's all new Big Ten for the most part from there on out. You left out Villanova, but that's you're right. the other game. So we don't play Michigan. We don't play Ohio State. We play Oregon, and then we play USC. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. I expect to win one of those two games. Probably not. Uh, I think Oregon's on the road. So probably USC, I think we're going to have a damn good chance of winning that game. And that's built on the confidence that comes from winning a game like this. So, yeah, I think things are growing. And uh, we'll have a good competition at quarterback, I believe. And uh, Billy Edwards will probably come out. But he'll have a couple guys who can play if he can't. So it's not like like we're going into this uh, one guy or, or else. But... I believe that it was, I think that was a great game, a great growth game. And you can tell me about Auburn 
you know, not preparing or not caring. But you know what? That falls in the hands of the coach. And Hugh Freeze took the heat for it. He oh, was I didn't say I didn't say he, they didn't care and they didn't prepare. I said they're coming off a game where they had their heart ripped out and they just haven't recovered and they played like it. I've seen Maryland come out ago, against Illinois and look like that. But that's no excuse. And there was a month later in a nationally televised bowl game, all right, and uh, for Maryland to to beat them the way they did, and they're Auburn, you know, and, and that's not supposed to happen. No, it's uh, not. I think it was a, uh, a big step for Maryland, and I am getting confidence now that they could go against one of these top teams and win. Now, is USC a top team? Yeah, kind of. They're not like Michigan, though. And, yeah. was, and is Oregon a top team? Yeah, they are. Yes. Yeah, they are. USC, USC is interesting because that's going to be another name brand game. It's probably going to be the national game of the night. USC coming to College Park. If things break the right way and the weather's good, you have the largest crowd in the reconfigured uh, Maryland Stadium because that's a name brand matchup. USC coming to College Park is a big deal. And the one road game I want to go to, other than driving to Virginia, of course, is I'd, I'd like to go to Oregon. I've seen it on TV a lot. I'd like to go there once. So if you can get six, you'd love seven, to go where you'd love to go where we can't win. We're going to have trouble winning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the tradition continues, Bruce. <laughs> but uh, look, you know, it, it's a similar thing next year, but it's not quite the same when you drop Ohio State and Michigan. But let's talk about the Big Ten for a minute. I thought Ohio State. They, they were just horrible. That was, First of all, that game was unwatchable, all right? But the way their offense was, what does that say about Ryan Day? In other words, you take Harrison off the team, and you take off the quarterback, who was really mediocre. They were, bad, yeah, yeah. they were a bad team. And if they played this without Harrison, who, won, who decided at the last minute to play that game, yeah. we'd have had a darn good shot of winning that game. Well, I think you got to go back to the same thing you talk, said about Auburn, or that I did, that Ohio State lost the game that mattered. And from there on out, yeah, they went to practice and they prepared, but their heart wasn't in it. Their offense was awful. And to me, it looked a lot like what Auburn came out and showed, which was nothing. They just didn't look like the same team. And this goes to, you know, after the Coppin State game, when we did the post-game show for basketball, you and I and Mason discussed that these bowls just don't mean what they used to. And I'm going to take Penn State a bit, certainly Ohio State, how Auburn showed up, and say this is why people say this isn't watchable. And it's several cases of what you think is a premier program just not showing up for a big game. Well, look, next year you're going to have eight teams. I think these uh, uh, these alternate bowls, it's going to get worse. Well, Bruce, I agree. It's probably time to take a look forward for next year where the 12-team playoff comes out. And we'll be back to talk about that in a moment after this word from Rick Jacklich and from Viner Four Gates. Hi, I'm Maryland wide receiver Rakim Jarrett. If you've been hurt in a car crash, people will tell you you need a lawyer. My mom says you need my lawyer, the Jacklich Law Group. Find out why clients, judges, and other lawyers call us the big dogs from the small firm, and why we've been named the best personal injury trial law firm in the entire country, as well as why the Daily Record, Maryland's legal newspaper, has named the Jacklitz Law Group the very best, best personal injury trial firm and best civil litigation firm in the entire state. Every single lawyer at the Jacklitz Law Group was honored by best lawyers in America. In the Jacklitz Law Group was the best decision anyone in my family has ever made other than my decision to play football at the University of Maryland. At 855-BIG-DOG-1. Don't just get a lawyer. Get, get the, the lawyers. lawyers. If you're hurt, listen to my mom and bite back with the big dogs. Since 1991, Viner Forgates has completed thousands of projects across the D.C. metro area and around the globe. Use Viner Forgates for your next IT project. Great products. On point tech support, projects that run on time. These are some of the reasons that customers love Viner Forgates. We make your company work for your next IT project. Call Viner Forgates at 301 
251-2900 or on the web at vinerforgates.com. Well, Bruce, the significance of the Bulls might really change next year with the 12-team playoff. How do you see that working with these current bowl games? Yeah, I think it's, they're going to hurt them even worse because now you've got four weeks of bowl games. All right, so probably uh, the first week of December or second week of December, you're going to start with the play-in, which will be uh, the f- teams 5 through 8 against 9 through 12, kind of like the second round of the Big Ten tournament. And that will drop you to your final eight, which will be your quarterfinals. And the following week will be the semifinals and then the championship. So it's going to stretch on. And, uh, you know, you're talking about the team that eventually, the two teams that last will play 16 games, Wayne. You yeah. know, you're approaching, NF, you're approaching NFL categories. But speaking of the NFL, those yes. first couple of games, because of the NFL, now the NFL now goes to playing on Saturdays and Sundays, you're probably going to see games on Thursdays and Fridays, real college football games that really matter because they're going to have to arrange the schedule somehow, and the NFL pays the most, so they're going to probably keep their dates, and we'll see about the NFL Thursday night game, but it sort of makes possibly Friday night and or Saturday night the only openings in the week. So it is going to be a bit strange. Yeah. I but th- you know what? You're only talking about four games and you could, the NFL is ever going to play more than three games on a Saturday. You can work it in. Look, I, I don't know what they're going to do, but the NFL is going to work with college football. So they're not interfering with those games that much. I you, promise. You would hope so. You would hope so. I think the other games, depending on how much money ESPN wants to put into this, continue because it's really inexpensive holiday programming but if you pull what's essentially 12 bowls 12 i'm not sure how many games you end up playing because there's four games the first week there's four games the second week then you have two games and then you have the championship game so that comes out to 11 games i don't know if that pulls the top 11 bowls into this or how this actually works out, but I'd imagine the the minor bowls for things like the Ohio Valley Conference, so the Quick Lane Bowl, or some of the other bowls like that, probably continue to exist if ESPN wants to pay for them and if they can find a sponsor. I think having sponsorship money is going to be the biggest deal in keeping these bowls if anybody watches them, because they do drop in significance. No, I agree, but you know what? That'll be arranged, and I would assume that every game will have a bowl attached to it. That'd be like, it could be the music city bowl. It won't be the bowl anymore. It'll be the music city playoff game or whatever, but uh, 12 teams puts a whole new picture on everything. And I believe that within the decade, Loxley will be in one. All right. I that, really, I believe that with all my heart. Don't you? That's a big move forward. That's a big move. Uh, so I got, Two other things that we could wrap this up and turn our attention to basketball, and you've got Ravens football, and I've got the NFL draft coming up. Right. So the thing one is in watching that game against Auburn, they called, those refs called nothing. There was more holding going on in that game than I ever recall. Nothing got called to the second half, and it didn't really affect the game because it was the same for both teams. Both defenses were complaining like crazy that nothing was getting called. I agree. So I don't know. Did you notice that? I noticed face mask penalties everywhere are not being called. I mean, I saw a holding penalty uh, by Maryland on the big run with Henby, I, I believe. And I yeah. saw uh, I saw just absolute hands to the face on every play not being called. And when they get away with it, that, that's what happens. But, you know, overall, it was uh, – it was. It wasn't Big Ten refs, was it? Was it Pac-12 no. refs? I, don't, I think I don't it was. Know. I think it was I the think, twelve. Yeah, I remember hearing it. That it was Pac-12. But look, it to me, it was a great day for Maryland. It was a great win, and I, you know, I loved the way they dominated. Hats off to Mike Loxley. Hats off to Billy Edwards, and uh, you know, I, it just was a, a super game. And the backup quarterback that bomb to. Uh, uh, Caden Prather was a dynamite pass. That was uh, Cam Edge, one of Mason's favorites. He loves him, I know. But the, I, I think this guy, MJ, is it MJ Harris? 
the guy that got from North Carolina State. From what I read about him, I it's hard to believe that NC State, you know, I think he got really upset, this kid, when after having a great freshman year, they put brought in somebody over him, and the guy didn't turn out to be good, and they put him back in. He probably says, you know what, I'm leaving. You could, right. you could just so, see the mindset. NC State goes out record uh, gets from Virginia. I think his name is Brandon Armstrong, and right. and declares him the starter. And MJ Harris loses the gig and and decides to go elsewhere. And I'm sure he'll have a, an equal chance to play. But when people said they they Maryland got him to be the starting quarterback, I'm not sure that that is exactly the case. I think I this is going to be a either. heck of a competition. All right, in closing because you've watched these games even longer than I have. This weekend, with the Final Four, and then the National Championship game next week, brings an end to college football as the way we've known it. I know it's morphed a little bit, but with the end of the Pac-12 and this change in the bowls next year, do you feel a sense of an ending to this era that we've watched for our entire lives? No, I don't. I feel it would be stronger and better. With a 12-team playoff, look, you know what's going to happen. There's going to be two or three teams that say we were robbed. You know what I mean? It, it, it doesn't – if you had 64 teams, you have it. So, in other words, that kind of debate is never going to end. There'll be there are clearly five or six teams, and you're right, the conference champions, what a great way to do it. No questions asked. They belong. And the ones after that, but I just don't want to see it turn into be – you know, an SEC filled tournament, you know, that's the last thing I want to see, but, uh, or, a, or, or frankly, a big 10 filled tournament. Okay. That right. could happen as well. Between but, the big 12, the big 10 and the SEC, you probably are looking at eight or nine of the 12 teams and you're going to get your team like Liberty or Boise state that still gets in. And you're going to get, from what it looks like, one or two teams who are left from the ACC whose fortunes seem to be dwindling. And there, there's 12 teams. So, for uh, – I know this is going up right away. We're doing it before the two big games. Let's make some predictions so we got some egg on our face when one of us is wrong. Because I believe Michigan goes to the house, wins everything. They beat Alabama. And Texas definitely beats Washington. And then Michigan defeats Texas. And I know you're completely opposite. Yeah, man, we, we did this after basketball the other night. I've got Alabama and I've got Washington. And I think Alabama is going to go the whole way. And you're right, we're doing this in front of a couple things. Maryland, Purdue. Terps have the tradition of being the number one basketball team. Number one comes to College Park on Tuesday night. Do the Terps have a chance? Uh, yeah, they definitely do. Uh, just based on last year, but this guy Smith, his new guard for Purdue, or second-year guy, he's all of a sudden turned into, like, the man. But this much, all right, I just was at a press conference with uh, Coach Willard, a Zoom press conference, and uh, he was really – I asked him about – I asked him about Edie, why the pros have, like, kind of not looked his way. And he doesn't understand why either, even though he doesn't fit the prototype of an NBA center anymore. You can't coach 7-5. You know, you really can't. And uh, I think he's going to give us more trouble than he has in the past. I hope I'm wrong, Wayne. But I think that I've been watching him play, and he's almost unstoppable. But then again, Northwestern beat him. It's something about playing on the road in the Big Ten. Oh, it's hard. It is really hard. Oh, Any well, the, win you get on the road in the Big Ten is unbelievable. I, I expect the same thing that happens all the time. Maryland will go, for example, 22 for 28 from the line on Tuesday night. Purdue will have 10 free throws. It always happens. And that's and how you, you win the game. You can't complain other, about it. In other great news, Mount Zion Prep combo guard, which I'll call a power guard, Malachi Palmer, who is, depending on what service you use, a three or a four, has committed to Maryland today. He's a 6'5", 185-pound guard from Mount Zion Prep in Baltimore, and he's your 
probably your biggest recruit that's coming to Maryland basketball who signed up. Now, Derek Queen came to the game with his mother, and I did see them off in the distance. They were uh, behind Johnny and the radio guys. Well, Johnny wasn't there, so behind Chris Naki and the radio guys. couple rose up. They were dressed in Maryland colors. The word on the street is that Derek Queen still leaning to Maryland. We're not sure about his entire family. So if you have Palmer and you have Queen, suddenly you go from very few to to a substantial recruiting hall and just two guys. So we'll see if Derek Queen lands on the Maryland basketball court probably fairly soon. Well, I hope so. I'll leave Indeed. it at that. Uh, All right. Hey, congrats on your Ravens game yesterday. That was a lot of points. Let me tell you, that was really something, Wayne. They are, you know what's unbelievable, Wayne, though? They don't play for three weeks now. I mean, they got Pittsburgh Saturday, but it doesn't mean anything to them. You know, I don't know who's going to play or whatever. And then you got two weeks off. That's a lot of buy time, isn't it? That's a long time before the next kickoff. But the next game. The next game is going to be classic because I predict it will be Joe Flacco coming back to Baltimore. That would be an (laughs) all-timer. And on that note, I hope you're right. And Uh, I will see you. We'll see everybody after Maryland-Purdue on Tuesday night. Bruce, thanks for jumping in. All right. Okay. And uh, as always, go Terps.